guess what y'all it's finally here a 1970s Superbird four on the floor 440 car all right y'all let's take a gander at this thing these things are amazing and today we're not even going to talk about the value of these cars because we all know how much they're worth and how crazy rare they are but we are going to talk a little bit about their history and what makes these cars just so darn unique. I absolutely love this car. This is my favorite car. I grew up with it as a child and it's meant a lot to me over the years. So starting in about 1968, they were losing NASCAR horribly to the Torino, just getting smashed. And so in 1969, they made the Charger 500, which was a Charger with a coronet grille and a flush back window and they were hoping to make it a little bit more aerodynamic and it helped but they had also been working on the Torino and making a rounder front end for it and it ended up <laughs> kicking their ass at Daytona. So they started thinking how are we going to beat Ford because that was the most important thing back then. And so their solution was to take a 69 Charger and put a nose cone and a big old wang on it. And then we're gonna take it to the wind tunnel and test it. And that's how the 69 Daytona was born. And that was an amazing car. That would do a top speed of 204 miles an hour on the racetrack. The civilian versions only did about 186 top speed, but amazing cars nonetheless. In 70, Plymouth rolled out their car because the Roadrunner had a big flat front end and it wasn't all that aerodynamic because the back window wasn't flush with the B pillars. So they came out with their new car. And it was a Roadrunner with coronet front fenders, a big old nose cone, and an even bigger wing. Actually, a funny fact about these cars, and I'll get to it later, has to do with the vinyl top. All real Superbirds have one, and I'll explain why. All right, taking a look at the back window here, it's kind of unique. So with the Charger Daytona, they had a little bit of time from the Charger 500 that they had already made the back window flush. Well, in 69, the Roadrunner's back window wasn't flush and it wasn't in 70 either. So it created a bit of an issue on how they were going to push this window out. And again, all these cars were pushed out in a couple months time because they needed to win races as soon as possible. So their solution to this for the production cars was they'll make a vinyl top, they'll put a back window in it, and they'll make a bunch of braces underneath here. Now actually underneath this vinyl top, it's completely butchered. The roof line back here is completely butchered. It looks terrible, but they covered it with a beautiful vinyl top and it makes up for it tremendously. And that's one of the ways you can tell a remake from an actual Superbird is every Superbird will have this vinyl top. The other thing is, is right down here, you can see this piece right here. The B pillars actually would come down here and connect. Well, since they aren't there anymore, there's just a hole that they, where they cut it out. So they put this piece of metal here, bolted it on, and that was supposed to cover up where the B pillar was. Now all this is a little bit different for the actual race cars. On the actual race cars, they took their time and had sheet metal come down, and this was all one piece. But on the production cars, they were just like, we need to get these out of here so that we can sell them, so that we can go out and win some races, go and win, which these cars kicked absolute ass, which is why they ended up getting banned at the end of 1970 into the 1971 season because everyone's a little crybaby. Taking a gander back here at the rear wing, absolutely massive. I mean, I'm standing here, this thing is at least two and a half feet off of the deck lid of this car. It's huge, just crazy. And there's a lot of myths that surround these cars because they're so rare and because there's not very much information about them even on the internet. And the fact that there just aren't very many of them, you know, the rarity is getting more and more. Uh, people, we're trying to find them, they're lost. That's the rarity of these cars. They only made 3,000 of them and that's between Daytonas and the Superbirds. So there's not a lot here gander here at the rear wing it's so high in the air and we were talking about those myths everyone thinks it's because the trunk has to come up to touch the wing they were worried about oh they're gonna hit the wing 
It's not why they did it. And I'll show you here. It's it's not an issue. It's not a problem. It never has been. Look, that's how far the trunk opens. You see that gap? That's a whole fist. It was made to be in the cleaner. The wing was made to be so high up because it needed to be higher than the roof line of the car because it needed to be in the clean air that has more contrasting forces. This car is crazy. One thing that started in 1970 actually was these tail lights. They're hideaways basically. And I've posted a few videos on my Instagram uh, at night of them driving this right after we got the clutch done. And you can tell that there's not a whole lot of light that gets projected from these. If you are at the side of the car, you really can't tell that it's braking. They actually put tiny little red side marker lights on the side of the car to show that the brakes are on, which is absolutely crazy. The other thing is, is they don't glow a whole lot. There's no projection on for these tail lights. At night when you hit the brakes, they don't reflect on the stop signs and stuff like a lot of cars do. They're just very in there and they're not very bright in the first place. Taking an even closer gander at the back of this car here, I mean, we got the beautiful Plymouth lettering. We got the trunk hatch there. That's a factory sticker over there because these cars were in association with Looney Tunes as a lot of cars were from Plymouth at the time. But another interesting thing is where the gas cap is located. Crazy, isn't it? Which it actually makes this car quite difficult to fill up. I'm not gonna lie. These cars are super long. This car's about 21 feet long. So when you pull up to a gas pump and you have to pull it past it, it looks absolutely ridiculous because you're not even in the gas island anymore. The other thing is, if you take a look here, these are factory chrome exhaust tips here on the back. And these are actually your reverse lights here. Taking a look at this huge nose cone here, this is actually why this car is so long, is because this is literally one and a half feet long, just a massive nose cone. This is actually considered the bumper too. So when they made this car, there obviously isn't a big chrome shiny bumper hanging off the front or anything like that. This is actually considered the bumper. Does it pass regulation? Even back then, I don't think it did. There isn't a whole lot behind this. It's just a piece of metal. It's just a piece of sheet metal. The other thing that we're gonna look at here is we got them pop-up headlights. Now this is, awesome and i love pop-up headlights it allows this car to have a smooth rolling silhouette and it makes it so much better and i absolutely love the front look on this car but taking a look here we can take a look at all the lines that john pointer the rocket scientist behind this car and i'm not kidding he was a rocket scientist made is right here these curves these elegant curves this spine in the front here they all served a purpose out on the racetrack and directing airflow over this car. And I absolutely love it, even more and more every day. One interesting thing about this car is it actually came from the factory with hood pins. Now, there are other cars from uh, Mopar that came factory with hood pins, but it just giggles me to see a car with factory hood pins, which is absolutely great. Taking a gander underneath the hood here. We've got a massive 440 six barrel engine. And the six barrel is kind of unique. It's three two barrel carburetors. Now, uh, Chevy had the tri power, which was around the same thing. And Ford, I believe had their own, but I have no idea what it was called. But this is an absolutely massive engine. It takes up tons of space in here. And there's actually a unique principle about this engine. The engine is actually mounted differently than the regular Roadrunners. This engine is actually sat back in the engine bay further and farther down than the regular cars. And that's for weight distribution. They wanted to be able to corner better and they didn't want all that weight high up because let me tell you, this 440 block is heavy. One way you can tell a Mopar is a big block is by the distributor is in the front right here and not in the back. All right, we talked about these a little bit earlier. These are actually a fender scoop that are supposed to relieve air from out from underneath the car. Again, creating more vacuum underneath the car, sucking it down to the road and giving it all that sweet downforce that this car is always craving and looking for. The other thing was, is they were kind of a multi-purpose. Not only did they do that, 
they made up for wheel clearance at high speeds. And I know that there are some YouTubers out there who have said they that's what they told NASCAR, which is, is what they told NASCAR, but they did serve both purposes. When you're out on the racetrack with these cars, you could watch the gap get smaller and smaller and smaller underneath this scoop. All right, one of the unique things here is on these cars that were all in conjunction with the Looney Tunes scene, they all got this badass horn. <laughs> which is honestly pretty great. And going to car shows with this, you've got a ga group of gals walk by, just give that thing a little tweet, girls crack up, giggle, absolutely love it. Talking about these Looney Tune themed cars, they came with these little emblems here in the door. They're little rubber emblems that they would put on the inside of both doors. You can see the other one over here on that door. The little one with the silver helmet is actually not factory. The owner put that one on there. But taking a look here, I talked about earlier, we have this amazing pistol grip shifter. Just feels great. The ergonomic, the ergonomics for these are just absolutely amazing. And I really do love these shifters. The swing in them is a lot, and I know that everyone talks about, oh, well, it, they have such a long throw, and who really cares? I mean, at this point, you're not even being the fastest driver on the road in this car. It only has 425 horsepower, but it's just the feeling you get from driving this car. The swing, the throw, you just feel like Richard Petty every time you put your foot in it and you just go for it. The gauges are actually set up in a all right way, I suppose. You got your speedometer and your tachometer with a little bit of a clock on the inside there. Moving over, you've got fuel, temperature, oil pressure, as well as voltage. As far as amenities go, back in 1970, about the best thing you could get here was this radio. Now this car didn't have AC, but it did have heat and defrost. Now operating things in this vehicle isn't too hard. You've got your wiper setting there, Flip it up for high, flip it to the middle for low. Got your sprayers over there on the right side. Over here you have your lights, you can flip once for park, flip twice for your lights to be on. And here you have your panel lighting so you can adjust the lighting inside. And this light will be on when the parking brake is on. A unique item in here is actually the reverse light. Kind of something you don't see very often. So when you put it in reverse, it'll actually turn orange. And it wouldn't be 1970 without an ashtray. Because you need one of those in your NASCAR. All right, I'm going to try and get in the back seat here, which isn't all that roomy, but uh, I'll give it a try. I'm six foot three, so it's kind of an interesting deal to watch. I'm in. Now, while I'm back here, let's take a look at a couple things. Uh, we've got the window roller here. So you can roll down all of the entirety of your windows. Ta-da! And that's about everything that's going on back here. One interesting thing I forgot to mention, wouldn't be 1970 without your rear passenger ashtrays on both sides. Taking a look on the inside here, that wing is actually braced in the trunk. It has this giant massive brace that bolts through. Otherwise, at high speeds, that wing would just crush the deck lid in. This is actually a one year piece for this car. All right, acceleration is all right. It's pretty great. <laughs> Obviously, there are squeaks and rattles, and that's kind of one of those things that you just love about these cars. Is they have their own unique little quirks. Acceleration is a lot better than I ever thought it could have been. Uh, I mean, even with these tall gears, I mean, this car really doesn't like to coast even below 15 miles an hour. It's not really a fan because the gears are so tall. I mean, this car in particular would go about 185 as a civilian model, and uh, it's just going to... It's got that vibe, and I absolutely love it. Uh, the steering is about what you'd expect it to be, a little bit boaty, but absolutely amazing, and I love driving in it. It feels so good. We went and put gas in it a little bit earlier, and getting gas is a bit of an exercise, you know, having to get back there. There's a spring-loaded trapdoor on that license plate, so it doesn't really stay down. 
But the just all the people who absolutely love these cars is what makes me a car person. The love that people have for all these cars. A guy pulled off the road in a Mustang, wasn't even getting gas. He just wanted to see the car up close and talk to us. It's just an absolutely amazing feeling. And this pistol grip shifter is another one of those absolutely amazing feelings. into this amazing car. I don't even have enough time to talk about its history. It's just absolutely beautiful. It is my favorite car on the planet, and not just any car, this particular one. Growing up around it left a huge impression on me, and it's part of the reason I became a car guy. If you guys want me to go through the history on the Superbirds and the Daytona, uh, comment, let me know. If you really like things like the Superbird, uh, we can do a Roadrunner here coming up. Uh, the Type 65 Daytona Coupe review got pushed off a little bit, so we're going to have to work on that. we got to put a new fuel pump in it before we can do a review on it, but uh, it's absolutely beautiful. Go ahead and smash that like button. <laughs>